That works. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Contrast Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, my name is Justin Brannan. I have the privilege of chairing this committee. I'm joined today so far by Councilman uh, Bill Perkins. I want to thank the members of the committee for coming together today to hold today, uh, the hearing. <coughs> I'd also like to thank the administration for doing their part in engaging with the council and city contractors uh, in development of the procurement and sourcing solutions portal, known also known as Passport, which will be the subject of our discussion today. Uh, this hearing will provide the committee with an opportunity to hear directly from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services regarding the development and progress of Passport so far, as well as what we can expect to see in the near future that will expedite and improve the procurement experience for city vendors. Uh, Passport was conceived as an online procurement portal that would enable city agencies and contractors to more easily engage with other uh, with each other through a web interface. This interface would allow vendors to track the progress of their particular contracts, offer agencies insight into the capabilities of specific vendors, and allow those agencies to expedite the process of determining vendor responsibility, which is a critical component for contractors working with the city. The first phase of Passport was launched back in the summer of 2017 and it gave vendors and the council a taste of what we could expect from this new online procurement portal. Passport's phase one permits vendors to file uh, their vendor questionnaires electronically, identify their areas of expertise, and allows vendors to review their performance evaluations on prior contracts in order to improve their performance when dealing with the city in the future. While phase one has been a welcome change from the antiquated paper Vendex system, uh, we on the committee expect much more from the phase two and phase three iterations of Passport. City contractors continue to complain about late payments from city agencies. In fact, the average time to complete a procurement increased by almost 5% from FY17 to FY18 to a whopping 179 days. It still takes agencies on average half a year to pay their vendors. This is simply unacceptable. Vendors cannot reasonably be expected to take out loans, lay off critical staff, or stop operations, all because the city's procurement system is broken. Instead, we must strive to do better. Passports Phase 2 is expected to be released very soon and should offer vendors the ability to efficiently catalog their management systems while offering uh, agencies clearer insight into the past performance of contractors who've already done business with the city. Phase two should also streamline the purchase order process and standardize electronic invoicing across all agencies. This should increase the speed of responsibility determinations, contract registration, and ultimately the processing of payments to vendors. So the committee looks forward to hearing details about uh, the forthcoming phase two at today's hearing. Additionally, we're already looking to the future and towards some of the features of Phase 3, including a searchable database for vendors detailing, businesses, uh, detailing business opportunities with the city and the ability of a vendor to track the progress of their contracts online. Uh, we expect that MOX is working to develop these capabilities as well, and again, we hope to hear some information regarding uh, these functions at our hearing today. Lastly, we know uh, Controller Stringer has offered several suggestions to improve city contracting and the vendor experience beyond Passport, and we look forward to discussing some of those suggestions as well. So before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, Committee Counsel Alex Polonoff, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, Financial Analyst Andrew Wilbur, Finance Unit Head John Russell, as well as my Senior Advisor John Yedin for all their hard work uh, in putting this hearing together. Uh, with that said, I will turn the floor over to Dan Simon, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, to get us started. Uh, if you can, please raise your right hand so the Council can swear you in. Right. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's hearing, and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Brannon, Council Members, and Committee staff. My name is Dan Simon. I am the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the City's Chief Procurement Officer. 
Thank you for inviting me to, to continue our discussions about the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, Passport, and the role it plays in supporting procurement transformation. As we have previously shared, we are working to make it easier to do business with the City of New York and to responsibly maintain integrity and fairness in our processes. In today's operating environment, the expectation is also that agencies can quickly acquire goods or implement services in response to policy goals and emerging needs. Technology plays a critical role in realizing this vision. Thousands of agency and vendor personnel interact to establish and manage contracts, monitor quality, and ensure accurate payment. The demand for reducing administrative burden and increasing transparency, clarity, and simplification can all be achieved with a common platform for collaboration. Agencies can easily share information submitted by vendors, oversight agencies can review procedural and technical requirements, and vendors can keep profiles current, track statuses, and execute open tasks. Our successful experience with HHS Accelerator reinforces these expectations. Accelerator allows vendors to update background information and keep documents current, submit proposals in response to requests for proposals, and manage contract budgets and invoices all in one platform. The scope of Accelerator has been available for five years and has significantly reduced cycle times for phases of the procurement process it enables. For example, invoice review in Accelerator takes a median of six days. The time is reduced because invoices are submitted against already approved budget lines, reducing inaccuracies, and eliminating the need for basic checks. Documentation may also be submitted in the same screens or via Secure Vault, and the sometimes necessary back and forth and updates can be tracked in the system. These features, robust centralized support, accompanied by targeted just-in-time outreach and training, have led to many successes at scale. But Accelerator only captured some phases of the procurement process and was tailored for human services providers. Passport was launched to account for all critical steps and industries. Our first major release of Passport in August 2017 replaced a decades-old process which required vendor submissions of voluminous paper documentation for entry into a centralized database. Nearly 11,000 vendors have now experienced the updated disclosure process without the need for couriers, notaries, or physical signatures. What was once a month-long process, at least, is now completed without, within hours for most vendors. City agencies use this filed information, along with other source data, including other oversight entities, to vet vendors and complete documentation required for contract registration. In fiscal year 18, nearly 10,000 responsibility terminations were completed in system, and this information can now be easily leveraged for subsequent contract actions, including by procurement personnel employed by different agencies. With Passport, this vetting process has been shortened from 45 days to a median of 21 days in fiscal year 18. Release 1 allowed us, allowed us to bring efficiency to vetting, helped us adjust our service model as an organization, and opened up the platform for vendors to become familiar with the new system, readying our vendor community to participate, to participate fully in future releases. In March, we will launch the next major release of Passport, Release 2, which has been primarily developed and will be implemented in partnership with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. This release enables agencies to order and pay for goods they need to operate and allows the city to sunset various legacy systems and manual processes. With more than 600 vendors and over 1,000 contracts to be deployed, Approximately 3,000 agency staff will now be able to more easily find items, track and confirm receipt of orders, and efficiently match receipts to invoices. This release brings needed modernization and additional efficiency to $1.2 billion in annual spend, accounting for over 10,000 orders by agencies. We are in the midst of multiple rounds of system tests and are on track for launch. We will phase in use of Release 2 through the summer and will also work with the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, do it, to incorporate technology services contracts. Release 2 helps us enable citywide electronic invoicing for these requirements contracts and this capability will be extended to all contract types in the final major release of Passport. Special thanks must be extended to the Financial Information Services Agency for their partnership as Passport interfaces with the city's financial management system, or FMS. In parallel with the build of Release 2, we began the design phase for the final major release of Passport, Release 3. This release will capture all end-to-end -end procurement activities, from solicitation and approval of awards to contract development and payment of invoices. And we will fill today's functional system gaps and improve the user experience to speed activities related to agency and oversight approval. 
registration package comp uh, compilation, extensions, amendments, and change orders. We're also tackling the structure, workflow, and content of solicitations, identifying possibilities for par parallel reviews, new and adjusted oversight delegations, streamlined standard contract development, and the use of pre-qualified lists and task orders. With these and other topics, we hope to keep three central design principles in mind. Standardization of process and tools to ensure a predictable experience for vendors. Radical transparency to improve communication and, and collaboration. And robust analytics to support real-time decision making and, and continuous improvement. New technology certainly isn't a cure-all and we aren't just waiting for implementation. We continue to advance policy reforms favorable to vendors and where appropriate also adopt tougher management approaches to reduce cycle times. But without technology, this isn't sustainable and bold changes will be limited. The scope of Release 3 is broad since significant changes are needed. Our aggressive timelines are in response to the long-held desire for process overhaul by agencies, oversights, and vendors. The time for change has now arrived. We are glad that this administration has invested in Passport and will launch Release 3 in early 2020. Our staff will work long days and nights until then, and we will roll out Passport in a manner that ensures ample time for readiness and optimal adoption. We look forward to partnering with this committee and the broader council on this effort. Thank you for the invitation to provide this update on Passport. I am joined by Ryan Murray, first Deputy Director, and Jenny russo Rennie, Deputy Director for Business Optimization. We are happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm all about radical transparency. It's my middle name. Um, so do we think that Passport, are, are we treating Passport as, I guess, is our treatment of, of Passport as a panacea justified? The, uh, I, I would really love to get away from the panacea meme here, but um, it's, it's what's required in order for everyone to do their work appropriately. The, the struggle, like I said, vendors, agencies, oversights like MOX or OMB or law, they don't have their hands around the work in a, in a, in a management sense because there's, no, there's, there's nothing tracking every single task in the procurement process all the way through that's transparent on all sides. Mm -hmm. And so it's the tool we need to get the work done. The reason I, you know, it, because in any, with any technology, it's only as good as who uses it, how it's used. Um, and what we're trying to do over the course of the next several months is figure out ways in which you can't back away from good use of the tool. We're trying to make it so that, you know, every required step is required in the system so that you know, we limit the amount of uh, risk into, you know, this not being successful because any one particular person doesn't uh, use it appropriately. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm yeah, it, yeah. trying to dummy proof it in a sense so that um, every required step is required. And if it is truly optional, then it can be optional under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. This is all hypothetical stuff. But, you know, in each area of the system, we, don't make, we want to make sure that it's tracking everything that's absolutely required and streamline wherever we can. I mean, I imagine there wouldn't be mu much that's optional, really. Yeah, I mean, th there are some options in the way, you know, basic contracts are structured. So you have all different types of contracts, they can be line item, they can be milestone and deliverable based, they can be rate based. Um, and so there are options in how you manage contract by contract. But so you need to make some choices. But in terms of, you know, compliance with laws and things like that, no, there's no wiggle room at all. And we have to ensure the system accounts for that. Um, have the complaints from advocates regarding late payments um, been integrated into the portal for phase two, or is that going to be in phase three? So late payments, just to, to draw the distinction, uh, if we're talking about human services providers, you know, late payment, it, it, this is semantics, but it's really about late registration. The problem we have is in late registration, not necessarily late payment, although the two is, is, is are connected, of course. Right. And so someone saying, I got paid late is right, but it's because their contract was registered late, not that the payment functions right. aren't working semantics, appropriately. Yeah. Yeah, total semantics. Um, absolutely. So that's accounted for in release three. In release two, it covers essentially requirements contracts. And so um, it's, it's focused on 
DCAS and a little bit of uh, contracts from Do It that are <coughs> sort of basic catalog purchases. So that Amazon type shopping experience we've talked about before, where the, we have a contract for mostly goods, um, but we can get some services in there if they can be cataloged. Um, but it's, it's managing those contracts. But what it's really doing for us is in terms of release three, which is the major release that will provide a lot of the functionality we're going to talk about, it's essentially a dry run with this uh, functionality to get all the way from a requisition through to payment. And so it's us building that pipeline of uh, cash flow from a requisition all the way from, to invoice and payment um, in, a, in, in these requirements contracts. It will, it will be a proof of concept for us in release three. Um, to have, and so it's, it's a setup release as release one was, um, and we keep continually build on uh, Passport um, to make it uh, enhanced, more improved. But you know, in, with release two, it's sort of, it's a proof of concept around the whole cycle, except for pieces it's not covering. But it's really test driving that, uh, that payment, invoice and payment process for us. Um. Have all city agencies come on board to Passport? I know you mentioned a little bit of that. Is DOE, EDC, NYCHA? So it, it covers, so Mox, Mox governance model is only over mayoral agencies. Um, DOE would be the one exception, so they've opted in. And so think of the 40 mayoral agencies plus DOE is sort of our cohort, but that would not include NYCHA. Okay. And uh, EDC, by way of SBS, yes, so it's sort of a yes and no. But all other all other mayoral agencies are using Passport at this point? Yeah, for responsibility determinations, using the, the release one um, portions, yes. Um, and then in your opening statement, you mentioned uh, the sunset of various legacy systems, like which? So at DCAS, they have uh, various systems that manage these requirements contracts now. Um, the name uh, CLIPS is one of them. Uh, what I could, we, it, and a direct order system. So some of these are mainframe systems. They're not on the web or anything. Right. CLIPS, I believe, is on one computer terminal at DCAS. That's how old it is. And on the home screen is C in all little C's, yeah. uh, and you know that old it's high tech man. Yeah, uh -huh. um, and 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 there are literal you know just paper catalogs that folks are going through to make orders. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's pulling all of that together into a new modern system. Um, phase two, we're saying what? Spring nineteen. Uh, we're comfortable right now saying March. So uh, uh, you know. I need a little bit of wiggle room there, but you know, we're at, at, at the closer you get, the more concrete you can be about a go live date. And so right now we're targeting mid to late March. Okay. Um, so one of the things I touched on in FY18, the median time it took agencies to complete procurement um, for competitively sealed bids was 179 days, which was nearly 5% longer than FY17. Do you feel that's, that number is accurate? If not, why? I have no reason to refute it. I mean, I can look at the data behind it and, and come back to you. But All right, just because it seems to me like the delays in payments to vendors are just, they're increasing and not decreasing. Well, I mean, I, I, again, semantics. B bids, right? You don't, if we're talking about human services, we're not doing bids for human services. It's really around RFPs and the numbers aren't great either in terms of the cycle time for our procurement. But we're not really focused on getting the days down. We're trying to get things done on time. If, if I have a, a human services contract, if I have a homeless shelter where the anticipated contract start date is July 1st, if I start two years in advance, that doesn't make the procurement uh, inefficient for it taking two years if I nail it on July 1 and it's registered on time and I can pay vendors as of the day one of the contract, right? I could also do that RFP in nine months, but nine months and two years, as long as I hit the July 1 date, that's what's important. And so that's what we're focused on. Yes, in the broad you know, scope of things, we want to reduce all these cycle times, but it's more about being timely than it is reducing time. Right? There are a lot of things involved in the procurement process that must be done. And so there's only so much that we can reduce it down by. Um, but you know, for us, it's more about, particularly with human services, 
where they're ongoing. It's not like you, you know, I want a homeless shelter for six months, right? These are, these are ongoing services, yeah. so it's very important for them to be on time. And so starting soon enough, um, you know, we, so we have the, I don't know how much we've talked about this, but the Nonprofit Resil Resiliency Committee um, that is chaired by Deputy Mayor Palacio. We do a lot of work with the nonprofits out of that, uh, out of that uh, committee. One which is uh, managing uh, a, a new policy that we just uh, issued in the past few weeks around renewals and extensions. And so it's use it, it's, it, we worked with agencies and providers alike to come up with a, a work plan for renewals and extensions. I have a contract with you. I know I'm going to renew the contract for July 1. What date do I start the 10, 15, 20 tasks, whatever it is that has to be done between now and then, what's the first date? And so giving them milestones to track um, and work from is what we've done. Now that's all done in paper, so it's very difficult to manage that type of stuff, but in a technology that, uh, that can manage those, that, that, that set of work, you know, it, it gets much easier. So what are, I mean, what are some of the tangible ways then, or help me understand how Passport 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, is going to address the delays? Why is it going to be easier now? Why am I, why should I expect vendors are not going to be coming to me and saying, you know, we haven't gotten paid. We haven't gotten our contract registered. So the idea around radical transparency is that it's transparent on all sides of what's required, what's next, and when and, and what they can expect, you know, in, in the future, right? So if there are, if I've done an RFP, I now have an award, I'm, I'm giving an award to uh, ABC nonprofit, right? There are screens and checklists and tasks that are associated with what the vendor must do and what the city must do. And whether that list is 100 long or 20 long, it should be obvious which ones are done, which ones need to be done uh, at, at, on a particular time interval, and which ones haven't been started. Sure. And so a vendor shouldn't be coming to you and saying, I don't know where this is and I don't know what is going on, right? What, what's going on, the workflow of that particular contract should be very obvious to everyone on all sides. I guess my concern is that the people that I hear this from are folks that have been doing this stuff since like before I was born. Yep. So they know, they know, it is a long time. They know how to, you know, they know how to put in a bid. They know how to fill out a contract for an RFP. They know how that works. Yeah. So it's not like this is the first time they're doing it. A lot of these guys are just renewing stuff. Yeah, so what I would say to that is, you know, having been an agency chief contracting officer before, sometimes uh, the, every time you do an RFP feels like the first time you're doing it, right? Because there are all, there, there are different requirements per RFP. There are different local laws that have come along the way since you were born. There have been different policies put in place because of, you know, Bad city vendors, bad city staff, bad city council members, right? Like doing well, what, doing <laughs> doing what they're not supposed to be doing. Every you know, every time one of those things have happened over the past three, four, five decades, yeah. that has resulted in another arm of the workflow in the procurement process. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's and it's not very predictable because while we're governed by the same set of rules, you have forty agencies doing slightly different things to achieve the same thing. Right? And what a technology will do is provide one way of doing an RFP, one way of doing a bid, one way of doing, you know, whatever the procurement method is, there's a standard way of doing it so that it becomes more predictable. An executive director at a, a, for a nonprofit, you know, shouldn't be expected to know every single document that they need to submit to an agency in order to get their contract registered. That should be something their staff can manage and is it, it's, a, it's just a trackable set of tasks that both the agency and the city uh, the agencies and the vendors are aware of simultaneously um are there going to be any consequences to some of the worst offending agencies if they continue to delay payments uh you'd have to define what you mean by consequences i mean i uh, right now there are none well look what we're focused on is solving this problem at a global level and we're focused on the technology. Um, we're also focused on intermediate, like I talked about in the renewals and extensions, trying to drive down uh, the, the late registration um, and trying to be more timely with contract registration. So we have short-term uh, solutions 
in terms of what policies and, and management practices we can put out there for agencies. Um, but, you know, our, our major focus is on solving this problem at the global level, which is Passport. So uh, according to, um, I want to just say we've been joined by uh, Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal. Um, according to Controller Stringer, over 90% of human service contracts arrive at his desk for a registration a retroactive, meaning that they've already, they've already been gunned, the, the contract's already been gunned prior to registration. Who is responsible for these delays? Are we saying it's because the, you know, the person applying for the RFP hasn't properly filled it out, but the city still wants the cheese sandwiches on time? I mean, who's responsible? So I'd say two things. One is that, and I've said this before, and, and not to uh, uh, belabor this point, but the controller, as, as the data has never been shared with us. But as far as we can tell, the data that the controller used included city council discretionary contracts. That is not a knock on the city council discretionary contracts, but they are by definition late because you don't know about them until adoption. Right. And so ha as far as we could tell, again, back of the envelope trying to recreate what the controller did, um, it looks like 45 to 50 percent of the contracts included in his metrics are city council discretionary contracts. So I'm not saying that we don't have a problem, but let's just be fair about where we're targeting our criticism to agencies. Yeah, I mean that. Th uh, that said, you know, there's also you know there's there's the responsibility again. There's accountability on both sides. Um, again, having been an agency chief contracting officer, I know that working mostly with nonprofits. I was at DYCD, right? You could get a lot of contracts done very quickly with the vendors that were on point with what you needed from them, right? And then there were stragglers, and then there were folks that were unresponsive. And so some, some of that has to play into it. It's, this is not the vendor's fault. It's not the city agency's fault necessarily. Can these things get done quicker, better? Of course. Um, but again, our focus is on making sure that there's, uh, that we shine a light on the entire process that everyone can see. Right now, vendors are submitting contracts and contract documents, mostly in paper, to city agencies, and they have, from a vendor's perspective, they don't know where it is. There's nothing telling them that they've submitted it, what status it's in next, who's holding it, where it goes, you know, what steps it has to take. Th that doesn't exist. All The only system that uh, the city has is internal facing only. And so we have to, that's what we have to change. I want to let Councilwoman uh, Rosenthal ask a question. I just want to tag team, and so very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, moving to di digitalizing this information should get rid of the paperwork. For sure. What's the timetable on that? So we expect, so I mean, it started with release one, right? And so August 2017, we replaced the, what was known as the Vendex process. So that was a huge amount of paper. Gone, right? I, I just—I I know I'm giving a long. One minute ago, you just said it's all about paper that is only. In, in sure, sure. So I'm just following up on that. Like, is it still awful? So, we, so without the full solution yet uh, deployed, oh. then okay. there are pieces of it that are still painful and manual and paper-driven. Okay. And that will be resolved uh, in release three, which would be in early 2020. And then the second quick follow-up question to the council members' um, questions is, um, the, do you still report on the number of p staff, agency staff trained on how to use Passport or Accelerator? And do we know which agencies this, where the staff ha is not up to date in the training because I remember a lot of times we would hear from the Human Services Council that the nonprofits were trained and knew mm. how to apply, but that it was an, the agency itself, DYCD, aging, that didn't know really how to use it. And that's my last follow-up question. Yeah, so I, I, what I would say is we have a different few, a, a few different uh, modes of training um, with vendors. Frankly, there were, uh, particularly with Accelerator, and again with Passport, 
the training was offered and most vendors picked it up and are using it without any training. I'm talking about agency. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, I'm just saying with, you know, we have vendor training. Correct. We, you could, vendors, are they trained? Sure, but relative to the number of vendors that we have in this city, very few actually had to take us up on coming in for a classroom training. It's not that complicated, it's fairly intuitive. Um, we do a bit more hand-holding with agencies. Um, just to be direct about your question, can we develop a report that tells us who, which agency staff mem members have been trained? Yes, we, we can certainly pull that together. We, d we just don't have a, a public report that says who's trained and who's not. Sorry, I'm not, I don't, Sorry. I just mean, you know. I, I don't care if the public knows or, or maybe and somebody should submit an LS, but I'm asking you today you i know know which agencies haven't or they're just people staff is just not quick on the uptake of how to do accelerator or passport i mean we talked about this three years ago and we got numbers from you on the different agencies and which ones were lacking in training so I'm not asking, you, you don't even have to reveal it. You, you can just say, yes, there are three agencies where we really have to keep training them. Uh, do, does that, I may not be explaining it well. Am I, am I not, um, is this, does this make sense, this question? So I would say that, and Ryan, you jump in, but I think, you know, we, I wouldn't say that it's even a culture at any particular agency. It's, it's person by person, right? We know who our procurement yes. staff are at each agency. Yes. And we know who we have issues with at an individual level. And we try to work with them as much as we can. And what we've encouraged nonprofits to do um, every time we speak to them and at the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee is you have to highlight for us when you see, uh, you know, uh, uh, the a staff member not using Accelerator or Passport the way it ought to, right? You need to highlight some of that for us. Because what we can't, we can track what's in the system, of course. But we can't, what we can't track is a staff member say, emailing a nonprofit and saying, just send this to me an email, right? Don't, don't upload it into Accelerator, so, right? I, we need someone to highlight that for us. And yeah. we, we drive that home to agencies whenever we hear of those instances. And nonprofits will, at times, email me when they, when, they, uh, yeah. when they see these issues I, and then right. we address them there. Ian, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, Justin, I apologize. I don't, I don't want to go down That's a great. rabbit hole on this. Uh, we had a hearing on this. The committee council was here. I forget the number. Some percentage of you, you guys are tracking who is trained on a staff level. And some percentage at that time had already been trained. Some percentage needed retraining. Uh, what I would ask is you get back to the new chair with th that information, and if you need a tickler from us, we can pull up the transcript from the last hearing on this. I know you know the answer. Uh, if you could keep the current chair up to date on how that piece is coming along. Sure. So, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, the last time you asked this as chair, we told you um, that there were some over nearly 2,000 staff who were trained at the time in terms of sitting in a chair. The explanation I gave at that time was also that that is not indicative. That means everything's going to be solved in an agency. Mm -hmm. As you know, and I think we've reported to this uh, chair and this committee previously, uh, we have a range of learning tools available to agencies. So there are materials online. Uh, we have at, the, at this time, I think, over 20,000 downloads of various pieces, uh, either videos or, or resource materials on the agency side. We also have teams deployed into agencies, supporting them where they need more help. Uh, in fiscal, I think, 20. 17, there was tens of thousands of support exchanges, we call those tickets, between agencies or vendors and MOCs. Um, and the range of those things were on the vendor side. It was often a helping hand. I just need to talk to somebody to listen to me while I 
look at the reference material and get through. In other cases on the agency side, we realize obviously that uh, we needed to go up to a manager level to think about if an agency needed to change its own process that had nothing to do with the systems that we use. So that's the answer I think that you're, you're trying to get at. It's not just who is sitting in a chair and doing hands-on trading in our office. We can of course get you those numbers, but folks use materials in various ways. Um, and I think the real question is, how are we supporting folks that may need follow-up support? Um, how are we getting at agencies that need a little bit more help as circumstances change, whether it's a turnover in a staff person, whether a manager changes? Uh, that's a lot of our help desk support. And then we deploy teams to do follow-up training or technical assistance. That's the real answer. It's not just about seat time or who's logging into our videos or, or materials. Go ahead. I mean, so what I was hoping you could do, because it's a basic question, I would imagine the mayor is asking you these questions, that you could show through the Resiliency Committee or whatever, over time, we started training in 2017. We did this much, these many people were trained, we did this much. In 2018, we had to train less, or the number of problems are going down over time. We seek to get them to zero. I, I'm just, you know, are you having the same number of problems that you had in the first year? I, you know, um, I, I am confident that Mox is doing the best it's can. That's not my concern. I, what I am not confident is, are commissioners as jazzed up about this as you are, or as I am sitting here, and what can be done if the missing link is on the agencies side so again I, yeah I, we're I not looking for platitudes sure. and um, I appreciate and know that you've been working on this um, I would just hope that you could come back with information on how the agencies are doing thank you I, I can sh share just three things with you on what the agencies are doing um, they have working very closely with us on the design of of release three, which I think is a critical step. So uh, they they of course know their staff better than we do. They understand that change is necessary. That's not a platitude. I think many agencies, commissioners, and they've designated first deputy directors to work with or commissioners to work closely with us to think about when changes are needed in operations in the agency so that you're not just taking a, a paper process and making it digital. You're actually making transformation. You're actually changing how the organization functions. So that's one thing that agencies have concretely done um, coming out of the work that we're doing with our executive steering committee, which includes commissioners. The second thing agencies have committed to and we've seen over time, and we're happy to get back to you on this, um, as you put it, uh, first year, uh, you know, obviously we spent a lot of time because we're the adoption leads, uh, training folks and rolling out with them. S uh, within months, we are able to then re send reports to agencies or, or at least updates to say, hey, I think there's something going on here. Some of it isn't absolutely quantifiable, but um, I th I'm sure advocates and nonprofit leaders tell you as they tell us when there are issues happening within a particular agency with a particular person or during a particular period or with a particular portfolio. Um, in those cases, we do have escalation points within the agencies and folks are very responsive. I think the other thing that, um, just to come back to the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, that is the place where I think the, the rubber hits the road in a lot of these cases where agencies, their leadership, citywide entities like operations and mocks um, are then coming up with policy changes. So for example, Dan talked about um, you know looking at upcoming renewals. We knew that it isn't good enough to just say, hi, it's renewal time, but some agencies needed a standard set of milestones to follow. Others were obviously ahead of the curve. So we they learned from each other. And I think this year is a test of how that management approach, that collaboration and escalation is going to work. Thank you. That's that's all I had. You really perfectly answered my question. I appreciate you. Uh, we've been joined by Councilwoman Inez Barron. Um, uh, how long do you think the the how long do you think contract registration is going to take once Passport Three is in place? 
So coming back to what I said before, for us, it's not about a number of days. It's about being on time. Um, you know, we have some uh, agencies and ACOs, uh, agency chief contracting officers that are very good at their jobs and um, their cycle times look longer, but it's simply because they start the process sooner. And so it's really not about how long it will take, but will it be done on time so that the start date of a contract matches the registration of a contract and payment can happen immediately. Um, so I'm hesitant to put a, a, a time frame, particularly if we're talking about human services contracts that are ongoing. Um, if we're talking about a new initiative where the, you know, it doesn't start until we, uh, you know, the contract doesn't start until we're done with the procurement, in essence, where it's not about late contracts or vendors working at risk. Um, you know, we, we, <laughs> we have uh, goals of being way south of what the current numbers are for bids and RFPs, of course. Um, but we're in the midst of designing the solution that will, uh, you know, so things that happen sequentially now, can we put them in parallel? Um, are, there, are there things we can eliminate, right? And, and so we're in the midst of trying to figure out what, what time box those types of uh, procurements will be in. Um, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a, a specific answer for that question. But again, back to human services, if that's what we're focused on, it's much more about being on time than it is about reducing the time. Of course, reducing the time from being late Absolutely, right? But it's about, it's about nailing that start date and that registration date. Is Passport going to require agencies to in inform vendors why they're late, if it is late? Well, our goal is to have a system that um, ensures that there's no mystery about where something is. And so if we know that July 1 is the start date and, uh, you know, we have a renewal, that is six months away, what's required, right? You have five tasks that are on the vendor to do, five tasks on the, on the city side to do. There should be no mystery about who's done what, what's so been completed. So what happens if you guys drop the ball and you're late and now I have a vendor who's got to take out a line of credit? Yeah, I, I don't have, I don't have, that's back to your consequences question. I don't have a, I don't have an answer for that. I think that's important. I mean, even if we know, let's say Passport 3, now we know who dropped the ball. Right, and that cursor is blinking, and it says it's someone on the administration side, it's the agency side. There's got to be some recourse there. It can't just be, oh well, it was Joe, he was sick that day. Yeah, I look, I don't, I don't anticipate that happening uh, necessarily, right? Like you, you'll know if something's going to be late and what but the, then, but the, the very, the, very, very rarely. The, implica the implication you're making right now is that it's all of the vendors. It's no, the no, vendors not at all. Fault. Not at all. Not at all. But I, I'm uh, what I'm saying is it's not always so cut and dry that it's it's solely on one side, on the vendor or the city, when something is really late. Um, you know, there are there are lots of different reasons why something might be late and the, city, mean, look, and, the, and the city might be accountable for it, some of that lateness, no doubt about it. Mm. And to bridge the gap between registration and the start of work, we have the, the returnable grant fund program that you know about. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's where we're at with that. And, but what we think is that with Passport and the accountability that it will, that it will provide, right, uh, will create speed. It happens everywhere, right? And with Accelerator, right, we have our budgets and invoices in the system. There is no, when you have a registered contract in Accelerator and you're doing your budget and your invoices there, right, there's no mystery about where your invoice is. You know where it is. You know if you haven't submitted it yet. You know if you've submitted it and it's in review by the city agency. You know when it's approved. You know when it's been dispersed. And then you see it in your account, right? There's that, just yeah, that type of account, that, that transparency and accountability creates speed. That, that sunlight just creates speed. And then what it does is it also allows the vendor and the city to start escalating conversations if there is some, you know, lag in what was expected. You know, we're 50% we're of the way there to get this contract registered, but it's only two months away. Well, let's raise some red flags two months out instead of wait until it's actually late to figure out who's responsible for it being late, right? If everyone knows what the process is, Within, we need to be on top of it simultaneously. Yeah, I, I mean, I get it. I, the vi I don't get the vibe when I speak to 
providers, you know, like again in the human services space, that I don't get the vibe that they're throwing you guys under the bus or that they're using you as a scapegoat, right? Um, the the vibe is that they're they're saying, look, we're doing everything we can, we're supposed to be doing, but it's still delayed, it's still late, it's still retroactive. Um, but if, look, if it shows that the volley is going back and forth and that the vendor or somebody dropped the ball, and that's something that they're going to have to deal with. But th from the stories that they tell me, um, that's just not what I'm hearing. I could tell. You know, it, it, of they're, course. Ah, they're just making you a scapegoat. That's just not what I'm hearing. Yep. Um, and I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it one bit. Um, I'm just saying I, I think it's <laughs> – I hate to say that it's case by case, but every single contract is different as to sure, why something yeah. can be late. You know, you have things as minor as – not that they're minor, but you have something, an ECB violation uh, on a building, right? Because the elevator repair date is 15 months old. Well, uh, that, that's something that needs to be resolved before we can put kids in a, in a, in a building. Or, you know, th those things just, you know, they're not anticipated sometimes. They come up when the violation comes up and then, all right, what are we doing about this ECB violation? How do we, how do we uh, remedy that situation? That's just one example of sort of a wrench in the works. It's not just about give me these five pieces of paper, I'll collect these other five, and then we're done. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why delays can happen. It's not so cut and dry that it's either the city's fault or the vendor's fault. It's there, there, are, there are forces outside of both of those entities that can create delays at times. It's really case by case. I, I want to I let a Councilman Barron ask, but just last thing. Is there going to be something in, in Passport 3 where – it's like some sort of warning, like, hey, you're getting a week, you're a week away, you're 48 hours away before this is just not going to happen. That something is blinking at somebody to say, we better deal with this now, or else the next time we look at it, it's going to be retroactive. Sure. So uh, I'm not sure about the blinking, but yes, absolutely. We, yes, those, but those alerts are not going to be 48 hours away. Right? Well, they, should be, so they should be nine, six, three months away. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. But and they're going to be... They're going to be escalated to not just the folks. If, if my thing is blinking and I've already been ignoring it, well, then forget about my thing blinking. Your thing's got to be blinking. That's right. We, ha we have some of that in Accelerator as well. So a as an example, you have to, so for nonprofits have to file their charities, uh, they file with the Attorney right. General's right. Charities right. Bureau. Yeah. And so if things hit certain – so we warn them, I think, at six months and then three months – and then I think 45 days, some interval like that. And each time a different person gets escalated. So at first it's at the staff level, then it's at the executive director, and then I think it goes executive director and board chair, something along those lines. Okay. But that is the basic principle that we're looking at where, you know, as time gets closer, yeah. you escalate to different people. Smart. And, w and that's either on the city side or on the vendor side, both. Right. Okay, Councilman Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel. Um, so phase one, according to the briefing, it says it started with vendors creating and managing their online accounts, which I think you were just going through, completing their vendor and principal questionnaires, enrolling in commodities reflecting their capacity to do business, allowing vendors to view and respond to performance evaluations based on their contracts with various city agencies. Have you completed phase one? Was it successful? Did everybody do that? And is everything moving smoothly? We think so, yes. So uh, since August 2017, we have roughly 11,000 vendors who have gone through what used to be called the Vendex process. Um, and uh, they've completed their questionnaires. Um, we've, uh, they're, they're called cautions in the system or red flags where there maybe have been a history of integrity issues and we flag those across the city for agencies that wish to do business, uh, for uh, vendors who wish to do business with the city, it, it, it alerts us to that information. Um, performance evaluations are being managed in the system. It's a small workflow, but you, uh, an agency does a performance evaluation, sends it to the vendor, vendor responds, and then it gets finalized. Um, and what we're also doing is what's called responsibility determinations. So based on those vendor questionnaires and principal questionnaire that those questions that we have now in Passport, 
um, agencies are doing essentially what is a background check on that vendor to ensure that we can have for that we can do business with them. So for every award that a vendor gets, an agency has to do what's called a responsibility determination, and they're doing that now within Passport using so that those with the responsibility. What did you call it? Respons responsibility determination. Determination. What if? What? How is that evaluated? Is there a score? How do you pass? How, it's pretty much a pass fail. You're either pass you're fail. either determined non responsible, which has some uh, consequences, uh, but uh, which one of which is you don't get the award in the contract. Um, but you have to the, the pass is you are found responsible for that particular contract. So pass fail. Can you uh, can you cure things that are wrong if you fail? Can you cure cure those documents or those shortcomings? Yeah, so if, if uh, there are all sorts of reasons why a vendor could have a, a, an integrity issue or a caution, um, and those things have uh, validity periods, so some co depends on what it is, but some cautions are for five years, some are for 10 years. Um, and so they age out um, uh, based on the particular issue. Um, but there's also sort of non-caution uh, performance issues that we may do a corrective action plan with a vendor for, okay. right? And so uh, maybe there was some, not n no malfeasance, but just a uh, mismanagement of finances, as mm -hmm. an example. Well, we could do a corrective action plan with that vendor. Um, they agree to certain controls and uh, uh, changed behavior, um, and then we monitor that, and they're able to then cure uh, uh, that, that issue. If they fail uh, in a particular fiscal year, can they reapply for another year, or are they? Are, uh, so nothing ever uh, bars a vendor from proposing or submitting a bid. Um, th there's no, there's no uh, banning of uh, applying for anything. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, somewhat related. When a vendor has a red flag, how long does that red flag last? So it depends on the, the question in the, in the, in the uh, questionnaires that it's associated with. Some questions, um, uh, the caution uh, is a, has a five-year period. Others, it's a 10. It really depends on what it is. So it depends on? I, we could go through the questions with you, but like there are questions around uh, unpaid taxes. There's uh, fraud. There's yep. being barred by other government entities. There's all sorts of different questions that they, if they answer in the affirmative and there's a caution as a result, depending on each question, there's, it's either five or 10 years. Okay. Um, let's talk about HHS Accelerator. Um, from what I'm hearing, it has not improved uh, timelines of registration, sort of, you know, gets rid of the accelerator part. What, um, <laughs> given that reality, how do we know that Passport is going to improve the timelines? Great. So, uh, A, I didn't pick the name, so you can't hold that against me. Um, but, uh, so as I mentioned in the in a testimony, I wish I could draw, but, you know, Accelerator does not uh, uh, manage the full end-to-end -end procurement process. Right. It goes from, it, you, you have your RFP, it manages the proposals and the evaluation, it then uh, assists, you know, it manages the task of selecting an awardee or some, uh, a vendor determined eligible for award, and then it falls off a cliff, right? And then that's where the internal systems kick on, right? And that's where all of the pain we feel is right now. And then Accelerator comes back after the contract's registered, sorry, Jen, and does budget it's invoice like a short, payment. It's a shortcut, kind of. It's not really a shortcut. At the time when we developed Accelerator. It's a long shortcut. It's, it's, it, we, we couldn't get end to end. Right. There's just a, there's a big gap in contract registration and accelerator. It doesn't manage contract registration. And so without it being end to end, I mean, that, that is all in that one gap. That is where all the pain is, not just around base contract registration, but all of the amendments. So the administration has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, in human services in this administration. But for current contractors, whether it be cost of living adjustments, wage adjustments, all of those things result in contract amendments to the, to the underlying contract. All of those things are, we don't have a way to track the registration of those amendments or contracts in Accelerator. Um, Passport 3 better be a great movie, man. You're really yeah. selling it up. It's, it's, a, it's not a panacea. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's what it sounds like. Um, 
The citywide savings program includes $90 million in savings from procurement reform beginning FY19 through 21. Do we know how these cost savings were determined? Um, that would really, um, we worked with OMB, but that would really be a question that uh, OMB would need to help answer. You know, our, uh, our, do we our think passport is going to lead to cost savings? So we certainly see how cost savings would result from reducing paper, obviously, and streamlining processes. A, a faster procurement uh, is, is certainly less costly. Um, so there's some obvious, you know, sort of uh, indications that there would be savings. But in terms of calculating what those are, that's not MOX's focus. MOX is focused on delivering the solution, um, not necessarily on the downstream uh, savings impact. Even though we know that they're there, it's just not what our focus is. Um, so do it and DCAS, in addition to MOX, have included passport funding in their budgets since the start of the project. Um, what what role or, or do, do these agencies have a role in the in the rollout? So, yes, for sure. So do it. Uh, do it definitely has a role. They um, so they were the holder of the contract. So, at the start of the passport project, Mox didn't really have its own operating budget, right? And so the con the contract was procured through Do It. Um, they provided a lot of guidance to Mox on uh, through the procurement process. Um, and up until very recently, they were actually they actually held the iValua. The iValua is the software that passports on. They held the contract for the passport implementation. We've since transferred it over to MOX for us to manage ourselves, but they played that role. The other role that do, do it played is they have, um, uh, they are managing the, the, the data exchange technology. And so they, uh, this is uh, awfully technical, but there's, a, there's, there's middleware that do it owns that transfers data from uh, FISA, iValua to passport. And so it, 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 in, it ensures the integrity of that data exchange. Um, and so they have a, a, sl a small technical role in, in our uh, interface work. Um, as for DCAS, DCAS is uh, the primary beneficiary on the city side for release two, right? It's all of their requirements contracts. They are in essence, the business owner for release two. Uh, in, a, in, in large part, um, but do it uh, as well. So to the extent that city agencies buy off do it requirements contracts, we'll be seeing those in release two as well. Are there contracts outside of that main contract for Passport? Outside of the Evalua contract? Uh, we have, I, I mean, I could get back to you on other things. We've had some small, we, we, we're bringing on a, a training vendor to help us with DCAS trainings. Um, so there are maybe some small little ancillary uh, items that support the project, um, but the main, you know, by and large, it's the contract with Ivalua. Is there additional infrastructure Mox is building aside from um, what Ivalua is providing? Well, we're we're working on a uh, a data uh, portal uh, to assist with analytics. So we are building out a you know a, a small data warehouse to manage procurement data. Um, that is separate from iValua. iValua has a reporting module in it, um, but this one would sort of house all of our historical data from older systems, Vendex, um, HHS Accelerator, and bringing those things together so that we can report out and not just have a sort of a net new Adalinux uh, approach where we can only report on what's brand new. We want to be able to bring all of those old databases together and be able to report out on the history of what we're doing here. So, I mean, I guess part of what my takeaway is, not so much that, I, I kind of feel like we're, the hope is that Passport 3 is going to show that it's like, guys, it's not, it's not just us, right? That it's the vendors also that are delaying this in some way. And that's the vibe I'm getting. I hope that's not coming from us, because that's not the goal. The goal is not to, the, the goal is to, to put well, the goal a, isn't to shine a light on dysfunction in the administration. The, the, sh the, the goal is to shine a light on the process and, and establish the right accountability, right? It's not to prove anything. It's to manage contracts in a, in a you know, in, in what should be 
uh, 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 an appropriate way. Like Absolutely. we have to get into this century with procurement. Yeah. It's like think about all the other things that you do in your life where someone's tracking something. Well, na you know, there's literal piles of paper on people's desks still, and we have That's to right. get away from that. Yeah. So it's not about it's it's not about vibes. It's not about no, moving I, I, anything. I, I, it's it's just, really just yeah. what is the process? Let's line it out. Who's Whose tasks are on the, what tasks are here, what tasks are there, let's all get it done. It is a shared uh, set of work. Good. Councilman, you're good. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys, oh no, wait. I was gonna let you guys go early on good behavior. But you can go. Now we're gonna go down wormholes. <laughs> okay. No, uh, just quick question. I wanted to make sure that you mentioned, uh, you had a great example of uh, somebody having an ECB violation. So oh, yeah, yeah. is Oath gonna be part of the middle facing, will they have, will you know about Oath violations for your contract? So we, we already have some of that. So we work okay. with the Department of uh, finance, right? So they have a, mm. a tracking of all of these uh, violations. It's already known to us if a vendor has, is in compliance or out of compliance with whatever tax check or ECB violation. Th those kinds of things come to us from those other data sources, and we're going to be looking for whatever data sources are available to us to, to flag Great. those kinds of things. And then the other question is for the construction contracts on that side. Um, if somebody has, uh, is on your list of, you know, a vendor that gets a flag. What are the consequences of the flag? So the, the purpose of the flag is to alert an agency that is, you know, the, the, is about to or uh, a vendor has won either a bid or has been determined eligible for award in an RFP. It's alerting them to information that uh, they need in order to make a determination of responsibility. So um, it's really up to the agency to make that determination. And the flag is just alerting them to this information that the vendor has disclosed or that we have gathered about that vendor. Would you ever have a situation where the flag would keep that vendor from getting access to bidding on a contract? It, it wouldn't ever preclude them from submitting a bid. But it could, depending on the seriousness of the issue, the, you know, the resolution, of whatever that matter was, um, it could preclude them from being determined responsible in getting the contract. Under the but it responsibility. Wouldn't That's right. Okay. But it would never stop anyone from submitting a proposal or a bid. There's no, there's no bar on, on, on that. So we house the information centrally so that Kinda if you are. Interesting. Only because we know some bidders that have done, we, we all know through, through reading in the paper, there are some bidders that have done egregious things, right? Computer service specialists, one egregious thing after another in terms of stealing money from the city. Why wouldn't we say, nah, they can't, they can't contract with the city. I mean, maybe we'd get sued or something, but it just strikes me that they would have not just a red flag, but some sort of, you know, how do they, they have stolen from the city how many times? time and time and time again. And yet today, I'm guessing they have a contract with the city, which is terrifying. But what are you doing to protect us from predator vendors? So the, the protection is what's in passport and those cautions, right? And so highlighting that information, every agency, if they were to, if, if, if a vendor was to get through the procurement process and they were selected for award based by low bid or they scored high on a proposal, they would have to come to passport and they would see that information, see those flags, right? And so that information is there centrally. It's not, it doesn't exist only at MOX, right? This is available to everyone. Do you know if Computer service specialist has any contracts with the city today? Uh, we could we could get back to you. I would like to know that. Okay. And what agencies, the size of the contract, and what it's for. It strikes me that it would be interesting for anyone submitting a request for legislation that <laughs> you might that the city would want to know, the public would sure. want to know. 
Um, and maybe in order not to be sued, you wouldn't even have the name of the vendor, but I am interested specifically, I am interested specifically in uh, computer service specialists, but that you would want to know by agency or category, the number of contracts that do get let to vendors who have red flags in various different areas. And again, it could be anonymized uh, for legal purposes, but I think the public, I think we have a fiduciary responsibility to let the public know that we are signing contracts with companies that have stolen money from the city before or have uh, a history of wage theft or have a history of sexual assault, sexual harassment on the job. We, ha we are contracting with them, and the this is what we've put in place to protect us from them stealing from the city again, from doing wage theft or, you know, addressing whatever issues that they've, uh, where they violated uh, us in the past. Does that make sense? We're happy to get back to you with all that detail, for sure. So there, right, right now there isn't, there is no sort of three strikes and you're out rule, right? No, and look, you don't have any lawyers on this panel right now. There's okay. a legal reason as to why we can't ban and right. bar and vendors not, from right. bidding and proposing. I right. mean, right. um, we can, we can certainly uh, write you back with the, the reasons why the city doesn't do that. But it's not for a lack of not wanting to do business with an irresponsible vendor. Right. Well, I mean, I understand you can't list, uh, you can't debar companies. I get it, mm -hmm. right? But what I'm asking is for there to be an awareness mm. that we are contracting with these companies, right? It's like HPD has on its website the companies that are bad actor companies. We may or may not be contract with them still because we can't debar them, but um, I think the public should know how often they get contracts. Sure. A a look, so uh, the, other, the other thing I would just add is that, you know, there are cautions for all different sorts of reasons, too. Of course. Right? And so you might have a staff member that did something inappropriate that you have subsequently fired for that behavior. And so... Well, and that's why there are footnotes, right? You have foot... That's the purpose of the footnote. Or that, you know, you would have a footnote, you would have a category yeah. of... Um, um, vendors who used to be bad but we don't think they're bad anymore so they're in this category and here are all the footnotes reasons why everyone's going to understand that right so of course and of course what we're really drilling down in is um, the companies that are recidivist bad actors or have the potential to be recidivist bad actors of course you want to weed out all the cases that you just mentioned Okay. Thank you. Thank well, you, Chair. Yeah, one last thing about um, Passport. Um, have there are any enhancements being made, improvements being made as far as primes, subprimes, yeah. um, the payment process, the transparency process, how deep you can go in the yeah. subprimes? I hear about that uh, quite a bit. Yeah, so um, are you talking about MWBE specifically? Yeah, yeah so, sure. uh, so uh, we actually had some design sessions around that last week and this week. Um, uh, we're definitely going to be tracking. Uh, so right now, the city tracks uh, the the first the first tier subs. Right, it doesn't go deep. Right, it doesn't go deep enough. So we're we're working on okay. uh, providing a solution that gets uh, to multi tier subs. Yes. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Well done. Look at looking. This Thank is you, sir. from <laughs> Side Dance. Yeah. Right. This was from a December uh, report, right. so I just got around to reading it last night. Yeah. So apparently, Bloomberg and Turner.